Welcome to the Ringer Podcast Network. I'm Liz Kelly. With the Super Bowl in the books, I wanted to let you know about all of our coverage across the site. We have Kevin Clark, Robert Mays, Roger Sherman, and more breaking down every aspect of the game, including winners and losers, key plays from the game, and the halftime show performance. Also, make sure to check out our YouTube channel where Kevin Clark talked to Amari Cooper on Slow News Day, and Roger Sherman chatted with players from each team for their thoughts leading up to the game. Be sure to watch and subscribe to our channel on youtube.com slash The Ringer. Basketball is very good. Jimmy Butler is actually a good teammate. Savanis is the most important front court pacer. De'Aaron Fox is better than Donovan Mitchell. Basketball is very good. Hello and welcome to the Ringer NBA show. This is Chatting in the Corner. It's not group chat. It's not the corner three. We are merging for this special trade line, deadline edition of the Ringer NBA show. Joining me today to break down all the action from the past, God, month, two weeks, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Paulo Getty. What's up? Danny Chow. Hello. And Kevin O'Connor. What's going on? Gentlemen, a lot of, a lot of activity leading into uh, the noon Pacific deadline. I would say the biggest thing that happened today was just a flurry of activity in the Eastern Conference. We were waiting for the West teams to kind of make a move. Seemed like the Lakers were on the fringes of the AD trade for two weeks now. <laughs> but the East are the teams that kind of really shook things up. Uh, the Toronto Raptors got a, a deal in place for Marcus Gasol. The Milwaukee Bucks got Nikola Meritic. And obviously the Sixers swung that big deal for Tobias Harris the other night. Kevin, let's start with Gasol and the Raptors. What do you think about this deal? I think for Toronto, this continues their bet on contending for a championship this single season. Yeah. Right? Where Kawhi Leonard, there's still a strong possibility that he leaves for the Los Angeles Clippers this summer. Um, but by adding a soul, that's an upgrade over Jonas Valanciunas. The the interesting thing to me is despite that improvement, you know, as having a better shooter, a better defender in Gasol, you're losing Wright, who is a solid defender and, you know, a solid ball handler for that team. And then CJ Miles, who has really struggled this season, but still, like last year, he can light it up. body. Yeah, he can. Yeah. I mean, he, he can stroke threes when he's on. And I do wonder for them, um, will the loss of depth be overcome by the improvement uh, having a soul over Valentinus? Well, one of the f- kind of the frustrating things about watching the Raptors recently is just how in and out of the kind of rotation that DeLon Wright has been. I'm a huge DeLon Wright advocate and just seeing him not play against the Rockets was just like, uh, what are, what are we doing here? Like mm-hmm. this is a six, five, you know, creative secondary, possibly primary, you know, playmaker on a good night. Uh, and he's just like not in the lineup at all. But I think for a guy like Marcus, all you make that move. Um, he is a guy who's actually like really good at guarding Joel Embiid. Mm. Uh, if you look at the metrics uh, and you look at the matchup numbers, he is like, I think he's held Joel Embiid to 33% shooting uh, over like 108 possessions. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty good. look at the rest of the East right now. Everybody is huge. And yeah. if you're saying these are going to be three of the teams at the end of the road, and even the Celtics, let's say the fourth, who has Aaron Baines, has a couple other big bodies that they could throw out there, having a guy like Assault in there. Uh, definitely is going to be a benefit. I wonder about the rotation yeah. in the front court now. That's what I was going to say. I'm really Serge. intrigued to see how Nick Nurse uh, uses Gasol, whether that's with you know Serge Ibaka or Pascal Siakam. Like uh, they clearly had a system that works that has worked until this point very well, and this is throwing a wrinkle in there that you expect it to raise their ceiling, but I'm it, it is still first year head coach and I'm just wondering how that's all gonna go. I mean I think with them, like we talked about the the loss loss of depth. When they're trimming their rotation to eight or nine, like sure. it's still pretty much locked in, I right. you would think. Like they still have Siakam, Leonard, Ibaka, Lowry, Green, Ananobi, Powell, Van Vliet, and then Gasol. That's <laughs> nine deep, that's right yeah. there. That's pretty much all yeah. you need. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. it, it's like they did lose some additional depth. But I think, you know, the deal was still a no-brainer ultimately. To yeah. Mark Gasol, like these ca- past couple weeks, like he off to a really slow start. And, you know, and he struggled in December, but he's been on a tear. Mm-hmm. He's been killing it. Yeah. Uh, I think with him, it's like playoff situation. He'll be grinding on defense. Um, he's another playmaker. Another playmaker yeah. as well. Yes. Uh, I, I think Gasol uh, makes a significant difference for them. Yeah. And what's interesting is we've been talking about 
the Raptors being so consistent over these past couple of years. But we look at this team now, and I really don't even really recognize it. And I think it's really exciting, especially with the biggest Raptor fan I know sitting to my left, <laughs> uh, to see this team kind of just not only uh, just facelip on, on the fly going into the season, but going past the deadline and coming away with almost a, a different look now. Right. Yeah. And and this has kind of been Masai's entire agenda for the past couple of years, right? Like he's really honed in on this idea that they have this mandate to win. They have to make the finals. Yeah. Because if they don't make the finals, then Kawhi's leaving. I, I, that's pretty much the sense I get from the entire city of Toronto. Right. You <laughs> spent a bunch of time there. Like, have you talked to anybody since? Have I talked to anyone outside of Toronto? No. No. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I have just been talking to Toronto people my entire time here. And yeah, yeah so. and and just to to give you a glimpse at our office a couple hours ago, Danny shrieked in joy when the news came down. Yeah. So this, so this, uh, this Marcus Saul trade has been something that's been floating in my mind for about two weeks, and I've been basically sharing a trade machine proposal to every single like <laughs> basketball fan I know. Yeah. And for the most part, everyone was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that that looks good." My proposal obviously had Conley as part of the package deal. I really wanted the, the Raptors to get both of them, but uh, we'll settle with this all. Would you have done that? Would you like what would you more you've given to to flip Lowry for Conley? I'm curious, like how much draft picks, future it, it, depth would you sacrifice in an OB? I you give it up look, if <laughs> if you if you were to put a gun to my head, and I've said this a bunch of times, gets a little morbid, but <laughs> if. <laughs> You okay. put it into my head, and the Raptors got the opportunity to get both Conley and Gasol. Yeah, I think I might include Ananobi. Right, because how much does it come down to their fate in the playoffs, what they'll get out of Lowry? Obviously, right. in the past couple of playoffs, he's been up and down. And this back issue, I'm really concerned. Like, I really don't want my 30, what, three-year-old point guard to, to be dealing with injections or anything like right. that going forward where you don't know what you're going to get. Conley isn't exactly, like, the ultimate healthy guard, though, either. That's true. Right. But I just feel like when you look at playoff performances and you look at the kind of ceiling that Conley has, we're only two years removed from him dropping 38 in a very pivotal game four against the Spurs in the first round of the playoffs. And that was against Kawhi. You pair them together and you have, you have like legitimate upside in terms of, you know, shot creation. It seems like Toronto perhaps maybe hedged a little bit because mm-hmm. like you still want to retain some youth and take a long yeah. view. That's what Masai Ujiri has talked about all the time. It's like when we did like the blow, Raptors should they blow it up article right. in 17, uh, I think that I quoted Ujiri at, at uh, the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference and he talks so much about the importance of the long view, having youth on your team and that's the way he's continued to build his team. Like even when they're in contention, you have to keep these young guys because right. if Kawhi yeah. leaves and Lowry hits a wall and continues getting older, well, you need to have those young players to to take you into the next era. And I, I would absolutely have so much regret including Ananobi in that oh, deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he hasn't been playing particularly well this season, but like I don't know, he just fits everything that they're trying to do there. And if teams are going to go small and then go the opposite way, you want to throw them out there with with Kawhi and, and Danny Green and be able to guard them. It is interesting not to switch over to to another team in the East, but how they're still keeping, like Kevin said, that long view while very much going for it right now. Whereas the Sixers, I feel like they, they the long view is Ben and Embiid, right? But if they are, it feels like they're doubling down kind of harder than than even the Raptors. Right. They've kind of they've traded away some of their young guys. So let's yeah. let's pivot to the Bucks really quick before we get into the Sixers. Uh, they traded for Nikola Mirotic, a guy that I've always loved as a player and. Last year, he kind of unlocked Anthony Davis when the Pelicans went fast, when they had Davis play a little bit more center. But now this season, he's going to be unlocking Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, they traded him uh, to the Bucks for Stanley Johnson, who the Bucks got from Detroit. Jason Smith, who will probably be waived, I presume. Uh, and four second-round picks, so it's kind of a good deal for the Pelicans. Uh, the Bucks were already the best team in the Eastern Conference. Are they like? Did they cement that? Do you think, Kevin? Well, it depends on if Miritich grows his beard back. <laughs> this without, is a big point. With, without the beard, Miritich is a insignificant player. But with the beard, he's a superstar. <laughs> right. Um, he does have that Gillette money, though. For Wait, sure. What <laughs> are you talking about? He shaved he, his he beard shaved and, and, and they on. freaking destroyed the Blazers. That's, yeah. that, that, that's <laughs> why they wouldn't let him grow it back. I yeah. remember last season when they were on that run in second half of, second half of the season, he said when they were here in L.A. that they 
his teammates were telling him not to regrow the beard back mm-hmm, because yeah. they were playing so well. So I have to say, he looks it's terrible ba- without it. It's a better look with the beard. Yeah, but yes, I can attest it, to that. Yeah. Yes. In all seriousness, though, is like Miritich is somebody who he's a streaky shooter, which yeah. is fine. Like that's okay as, as a role player. Um, but you know, I think ever since he really got traded from Chicago to New Orleans, he feel, it feels like he's taken a little bit of a leap. Um, I, I think for Milwaukee, look, giving Giannis another floor spacer. In addition to Brooke Lopez and Ersan Ilyasova, who has size, because like the issue last year with Milwaukee is they could only space the floor for Giannis when they put Giannis at the five, but that was unsustainable. You just couldn't do that because you're facing big men or Embiid or or Horford or now we're talking about Gasol. You need size, and now they can space the floor with Lopez, Ilyasova, and Miritich, and still have size on their team to for for Anthony Kumpo. It's kind of just doubling down on their biggest strength of the season, which is having shooting at every single position. And I think with Miritich, you kind of get a little bit of an insurance policy with, uh, especially for the playoffs with Brook Lopez. Kind of, it, we all we all kind of imagine Brook Lopez being kind of a defensive liability in the playoffs because of his inability to guard from outside. Miritich doesn't necessarily have that problem. I think Miritich can kind of be there. Brook Lopez type player for at least the first two rounds. Right. He's like a, he's a midsize Brook Lopez. Yeah. Like if Brook yeah. Lopez is your like your tank, like Miritich is somewhere in between that. And if I have any sort of criticism of the deal is that perhaps Miritich isn't as, as wingy as perhaps they need in order to kind of flex at that position. Because you are, if you want to go a little bit smaller, it's Miritich, not necessarily an Ananobi type who can kind of flex to the four there. So yeah. I, I wonder how the matchups will play in that regard. That's a good point. I think the interesting thing about the Bucks is that they have the best of both worlds and that they have a very specific system that works. But also they have a superstar on top of that in Giannis. So it, it almost feels very much like a plug and play kind of situation with Miritich. And so I don't think they needed to go do something. More. I mean, this I, this even feels drastic in a sense compared to like what I thought maybe they would do. It was something a little more minor, but it makes a lot of sense because of, of all the things you guys have said in terms of the shooting and the stretching right. the floor. And they only had to give up Thon Maker to, yeah, exactly. to get it done. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I still have some hope for, for Thon and... It's a lot of second round picks. One is coming from the Nuggets, two is co- are coming from the Wizards, and only one is coming from the Bucks. So they did have a surplus to deal from. But those Wizards picks could be good. It could be really 20 good. Twenty and twenty one. Yep, twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. Those Wizards picks when potentially like they'll be staring at John Wall and literally nothing else. Uh, I I think it was just the aggressiveness that Milwaukee showed. They could have just rested on their laurels, but they haven't. They made the deal for George Hill and to get off some money, and now they're kind of uh, pushing forward yet again and. Uh, I love it because it, it doesn't really change what they do to, to Paolo's point. They, it just kind of enhances yeah. what they've already built. So it's not like you're throwing someone in there like a Gasol who maybe will take a couple games, a couple weeks to kind of figure things out. Yeah, definitely. And I think with Miritich, like there's, there, you got you mentioned like yeah, he might be a defensive liability. It's like that that's true. I mean, like he's he's a weak defender. Like how does he defend, uh, you know, Ben Simmons if he's on that? You know, it, it, how does he defend Jimmy Butler on a switch? Something like that. Th- that's legitimate, fair questions. But what are your alternatives? Like, who else are you yeah. going to get? Meritich, Meritich still gives them another body, another guy who can help in space of four on the offensive end. It's a good addition for them. Yeah, and and obviously the the other one here, uh, we the Ringer NBA show talked about it with with Bill and, and Chris the other day. But uh, the Sixers getting Tobias Harris for uh, those picks for Shamit and and some of the other guys there. Uh, it's just an interesting move that you know all of the the Eastern contenders outside of the Celtics are kind of going for. Any like lingering thoughts to wrap up that sort of part of it? I just yeah, I, I just think it's interesting that all of these teams are kind of matchup proofing their rosters in order to kind of all of these teams are basically playing chess simultaneously. You know, uh, the Sixers have kind of doubled down on having basically five potential All Stars in their starting lineup. Just all out offense. Uh, the Bucks have kind of doubled down on their shooting, and the Raptors have kind of addressed maybe a few minor concerns about the way their system runs. You put that all together, it's like, man, the second half of the season is going to be so exciting to watch. I love this trade for Philly, despite yeah. the risk. Like, mm-hmm. there's risk here. And Tobias Harris could leave this off season, um, and you could end up giving up two first round draft picks for a couple month rental. However. 
Tobias Harris, with his offensive versatility, he can run pick and roll. He can be used as a screener. He's a smart cutter. He's a great shooter, not just in spot ups, but off screens as yep. well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you're losing a good shooter in Shannon, but you can plug Harris into some of those situations. He's yeah. yeah, he's right. huge. And now he's, you know, he's less of a defensive liability. Shannon, I think maybe. You know, some of us try to try to score on Chamit. Right. <laughs> have a little bit of opportunity. Man, a little I'm bit. Of, I mean, I'm not saying I could. I couldn't. But I'm just saying, I, I think with Chamit, he's a defensive liability yeah. in a playoff I, situation. Harris um, is an average defender, at least. I think for Philadelphia, uh, now they, ha- like you said, they're matchup proof, Danny. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to put it. Where, and plus, if Jamie Butler were to walk, now you have Tobias Harris who could elevate into that third star role. When he was here with the Clippers, he always struck me as a guy who didn't need to be the main guy, even though he has been at every one of his other stops. So I think we've, I've heard mention, you know, like, okay, so he's been the guy at his other stops. Is that going to be of some concern with the Sixers who have so many guys? And I think it's actually going to be the opposite. I think he's going to be totally fine with like having a lower usage and just right. being kind of like a spot up shooter, just being a guy who helps the offense move along when, you know, things aren't working so well with. Uh, Embiid and Simmons or with Butler's having an off night Mm -hmm. yeah my analysis of the trade is it's it's a good player bad trade I think that Tobias was the right player to go out and get I think he fits for a lot of the same reasons you guys have mentioned and I also think he's a clear upgrade over a guy like Nikola Mirotic a guy who I think a lot of people would have liked to see the Sixers go after as an upgrade to that four spot upgrade like pretty much uh, an upgraded version of Mike Mascala in order to throw in there. You could probably get him for a couple seconds as the Bucks clearly showed. But uh, I really like that starting lineup. I just don't know about the cost. And not only the cost they they paid immediately, but having to now max out essentially both Harris and Butler while also bringing back J.J. Redick. And on top of that, I think it's not just the money because if Josh Harris, their owner, wants to pay that, I also wonder what it's going to do to limit them on their fringes because of the luxury tax implications, not only this summer, but when they get into the repeater tax. It, it, it's like, you know, the, that's the one concern is where is the point of diminishing returns for Tobias Harris? When we're talking about all the nice things that he can do as a off- versatile offensive player, but if Ben Simmons is dominating the ball and Jimmy Butler's dominating the ball too, and Joel Embiid as well, I mean, he's not the playmaker like those guys, but he's going to get a lot of half court touches what does Harris become in that fourth star role moving forward uh, I, I think for Philadelphia even if those you re-sign all those guys having him on the roster just, I'm just saying you could trade Jimmy Butler in six months it, Blake Griffin yeah, style it's the just bird saying. in the hand I mean and as we've seen it seems like teams that aren't in LA that aren't in New York have to do their work early because there are only so many guys available on mm-hmm. this market and all of a sudden, if you're the Sixers and you have this window when Ben Simmons is on his rookie contract and you're left with nothing, if you're left not even with a Chris Middleton or some of these lower level guys at like Kemba Walker, then uh, what are you going to do? So it, it made sense in that regard. Yeah. I mean, for Tobias Harris, there was a report earlier about, <coughs> I, I think a reporter asked him about, you know, what his priorities were heading in free agency. And he pretty much said the right things, I guess. Like you, he wanted, you know, a winning uh, culture in the team. He wanted, you know, a, a good system and like, you know, teamwork, you know. So if if all things, you know, play out well with the Sixers, I I can see him staying, definitely. I'm surprised he didn't say, who are you? Why do I need to talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, the, sorry, I was going to say, the thing is, we were talking about the financial situation, but they did also get off faults today, uh, which helps him, I think, in terms of getting rid of that contract. Yeah, it definitely does ease their financial burden moving forward. Uh, it's kind of sad. Fultz got moved this quickly. Number one pick in, in 17, and then gets moved for Jonathan Simmons and a top 20 protected first round pick. Yeah. And an early second could be nice. Right. They um, didn't even get like the wing that we all thought from Orlando. Right. Yeah. They didn't get yeah. Terrence Ross. <laughs> it seemed destined that they were going to find a way to get Terrence Ross, and it didn't happen. It was amazing. Yeah, they are getting a lot of these kind of like scrappy guys into that system. Like I like James, James Ennis. Ennis yeah. uh, I I like like kind of the toughness that J- Jonathan Simmons brings. It just feels like a like a Meek Mill team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? do, do you think Jonathan Simmons is the Sixers Kyrie stopper? <laughs> wow. Uh, um, I mean, you, you hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, that's like one of the points I think Bill brought up on yesterday's pod. Like, who guards Kyrie? Yeah. I, I think um, they have some solid defenders. Jimmy yeah. Butler with his size. Uh, I think the, 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 the inverse is is who yeah. who does. 
Kyrie guard. Right. And it's yes. the inverted yes. question with Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Like the size they have on their team and the amount of versatility. Look, they increased their odds of getting to the finals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's and that, that's the that size simple. that they showed when they beat the Warriors recently too, which is that overwhelming size that can throw off a team with a little more talent maybe. Yeah. All right. So just to wrap this up here, among these three teams, which one is is your favorite going forward in the East? Danny, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> just yeah. say it. Just say Spill it. it. The Raptors. Yeah, that's right. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> Raptors are back. Paolo? I'm going to lean Sixers just because of the starting lineup that they have, which is, I think, better than everybody else's. It's Milwaukee because they have the best player on, uh, on yeah, all three fair. teams. Even though Kawhi... Dude, yeah, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> Kawhi's right there. So. <laughs> I, I will say, though, like, I'm happy for all these teams. Like, congrats on your new trades. But, like, this is just, like, hey, who's going to... who's yeah. Which one of us is going to get beat by the Warriors in the final? Right. I also love Milwaukee's system, too. Yeah, yeah I think that's with, a good with their, the shot distribution, right. all, you know, at the rim, and a lot of threes. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and they're Milwaukee. basically missing the one thing that kind of held the Hawks back, which is a transcendent superstar. Mm-hmm. They This is basically the same team last year that was, what, 7th or 8th in the Eastern Conference? And, they, like, they, yeah, they hung with the Celtics in that first round. But, like, this is a completely different team. They really haven't done that much to it. Yeah, I mean, like they they made like the three or two and, and until today additions with Lopez and Ilyasova and like some younger yeah. guys like DJ Wilson is coming along. So it's like they made the right tweaks to their personnel, but the systematic change was was the the greatest one of all for them. Yeah, it's it's like they they have like almost similar to the Houston Rockets shot distribution with threes right. and layups, but like with a completely different style ball movement and everything else. Um, It's not just all pick and roll like it is for Houston. It's fun to watch. Yeah, I want to believe in the Bucs, but ultimately I I just think the Raptors, just the collection of talent plus everything in that system works. They're kind of like the best of of both ones. Nobody believes in the Sixers. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe I believe him. I do. Yeah, All right, I do. we're yeah. we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna come back and talk about Anthony Davis, a guy you may have heard before. Basketball is very good. And we just wrapped up the East. So let's turn to the Western Conference. Not as much happening there. Uh, probably the biggest thing that did happen was the fact that Anthony Davis did not get traded. Uh, it seems like when it all came down to it, the Pelicans were just trolling the Lakers. I don't know how much yeah. truth that is, but Brian Windhorst dropped that at ESPN the other day that they were kind of just uh, giving it back to LA for kind of all the turmoil they put them through over the past couple weeks. I definitely believe it. That seems like a Dell Dems move to make. And if uh, you're kind of on your last leg there, you might get let go before the summer. Like, why not just fuck with some people? So I appreciate that, <laughs> despite all the bad that Dell has incurred on that uh, on that franchise. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I guess the Lakers would be the best place to start here. It just seems like they had the most writing on this trade happening, and they have the most to lose now that it's going to leak into the draft and this summer into free agency. Um Kevin, what do you think it means for the Lakers going forward? Well, they're under a lot of pressure. That's for sure. I mean, I think Boston immediately vaults to the top of teams most likely to make a trade for Anthony Davis this summer with the amount of assets that they can offer. I mean, the fact is is that teams besides the Lakers are are calling the Pelicans, making offers, and the fact they said no to all of those, I think at least indicates that there's 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 something out there for them that they're waiting for in June or July, and that's probably from Boston. Uh, so for the Lakers, it's like, well, what's your alternative here? N- now you at least have a chance to sign a max free agent. You can at least try to make a pitch to Kawhi and KD and Clay and all those guys and Kyrie, and odds are you won't get them. Uh, so maybe you're down to like the Jimmy Butlers and DeMarcus Cousins types of the world, or even a Tobias Harris, or like and- you know. Fingers crossed, Clay Thompson. Yeah, oh, I mean, that's what you're yeah, hoping man. for. So it's like you hope you sign one of these guys. You hope you can still trade for AD. But if you can't, you're turning your attention to somebody else that you don't have to give up all your assets for. So it's not like it's the end of the world for the Lakers if they don't get AD. Um, they still can get get two good players this summer. Uh, but the fact is, is that their their chances of getting AD are severely, severely diminished. So do we think Reggie Bullock is the answer? Here going forward, because that's all they came away <laughs> no, with the it's deadline. Mike Muscal. Yes, Mike oh. Muscal was another deal that they swung with the Clippers. <laughs> Get some floor spacing for him at least. Oh yeah. I mean, I've somebody pointed like this out, but it's funny how like 
in the offseason when they got LeBron, it's like, oh, we're going to surround him with playmakers. And now the two trades <laughs> they've made is to surround him with actual Ridiculous. spacers, which are going to help. Well, right. Yeah, because LeBron says the same thing at the start of every year. <laughs> right. And then eventually it just, it, it all warps back to what he's good at. And it's like, yeah. well, you just need to surround him by, surround him with a bunch of floor spacing and just let him do his work. Yeah, I, I, they're 27 and 27 right now, even 500, which feels appropriate given how good they looked at times earlier in the season and how bad they've looked, especially without LeBron on the floor. Uh, they're two and a half games back of the Clippers and one game back of the Kings. The Clippers, we expect to not be there, unfortunately, despite I thought they had one of the better deadlines. I know Paolo does too. Uh, the Kings also swung some trades. They got Harrison Barnes in there. What else did they do? Oh, they got Alec Burks. Sure, why not? Kings uh, <laughs> fans didn't love that. Uh, really? Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, Iman yeah. Shumpert was energetic yeah. and was good for chemistry. It was a weird thing where like Iman Shumpert kind of truly embraced the community. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did so, seem to be like their their avatar, their mascot. Yeah. And he was the, yeah. the veteran in the locker kind of rallying some of those young guys. He was very loud in the locker room. That. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I remember. from, from Which is important yeah, for no, a young I team. They, they, I think they, they literally benefited from that, which you, is crazy. You mentioned those teams that are ahead of the Lakers in the standings. Do you think with all this turmoil and, you know, players being unhappy, like Rajon Rondo, I think, summed it up well the other day. He mentioned how, like, just because the deadline passes doesn't mean this goes away. It's still right. in your mind. Like, do you right. think with everything that's happened to this team over the couple past couple 10 days or so since 80s trade a man, does this diminish their chances, even if LeBron plays out the rest of the season fully healthy, of actually making the playoffs over the Kings or the Clippers? I would still bet on them making the playoffs because they have LeBron. But at the same time, like if you watch that Pacers game oh. from the other night, it was Ugly. sad. It was, was just it like 42 point loss. Yeah, exactly. Like th- these guys are so not in the right headspace to play a basketball game. And I don't know how that, I'm very interested to see how that go, how that changes like, or how that doesn't change going forward. Like, yo, they're chanting at them. Like yeah, LeBron right. wants you traded or I, whatever. <laughs> I would watch an entire like redub of that game, except Bill doing his whole body language doctor. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, yeah. It was, it was bad. I guess the, the counter to that would be that's as bad as it could possibly get. Sure. Cause LeBron is going to get healthy. Presumably. I mean, a groin issue is the type of thing that can tend to like linger into a oh, season. Yeah. It does feel like Rajon Rondo while he's back in the lineup is a guy who could easily go out. Uh, Lonzo ball, you know, who knows when they'll get him back, but they will get him back. Mm-hmm. And Ingram will probably fall in line at some point. He's been down most of the season, but he is prone to turn it on later in a season. So maybe it's just happening later than usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know. I just I can't bet against LeBron right now. I mean, how how surprising would it be if LeBron did the LeBron thing again and got this exact roster to the at least the Western Conference Finals? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's been dragging the Cavs roster for the last few years to the finals. Yeah, I, I, it's I don't even think that would surprise me that much. Right. I mean, who is the biggest competition to the Warriors right now? This is going to open up a new Pandora's box, but sure. like. Is it the Thunder? Houston, Nug- still, I think. Yeah, Houston. I would go Thunder because of the defense. Yeah, I bet you Houston, when Capella gets back, is going to look pretty sure. good. I, I'd pick Houston and Denver. Yeah. Um, but I would a- ahead of OKC. I sure, think. but yeah. what I'm saying is, I would pick a LeBron the team probably over all those teams. I do think. Fair. I mean, you can't bet against LeBron, <laughs> yeah. right? And not only does do they have like this core for this season, and like maybe things will get better, but I do wonder if like. Now that these guys know that AD isn't a realistic option, or I don't know how much they believe that, but like maybe they do kind of buy into what's going on under LeBron. Things get a little bit better. And all you need is maybe a guy like a Bradley Beal, maybe like these B-level stars that they can go out and sign or swing a trade for. Um, Beal is my new pet project for this team. I would love it. Let's just presume that Anthony Davis is off the table. He's going to go to Boston. He's going to go to New York, wherever he's going to go. Uh, I just think it makes a lot of sense to almost like operate like you're the Clippers and not like reach for the the era defining center, but get guys who are kind of those an all star to augment LeBron. Like almost, yeah. It, it's basically like what the Bucks are doing around Giannis. You want shooters around LeBron, right, as we just right. said. Maybe the Wizards are more likely to deal Beal, and then you sign someone like I don't know Chris Middleton as your next guy. That's a pretty damn good team, and that's why they're 
suppose plan B is to go after Clay Thompson because he would fit that bill perfectly. Sure. But I don't know what the chances right. of that might are. Might have to go to like your plan F or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. Clay does like that he would need to take a discount, which yeah. is awful. I think, you know, for, for the Lakers, like, like I said earlier, it's not the end of the world for them. I think the, the Warriors have distorted our, our view of what it is required to win a championship. Like you could, if you add a middle 10 and then trade for, let's just say Beal, just for the sake of conversation. Um, that's a that's a good team around that's LeBron James. Really, like that's yeah. a, in a normal world, that's a championship contender. Um, so I think for them, it's not the end of the world here. Yeah, uh, I just think it might be the end of your chances of getting AD until the twenty twenty off season. But are you really going to punt cap space this year? That's for the, the question. At AD next summer, I don't think. Oh, so. and also well, another year of LeBron aging. Yes, mm-hmm. that's the thing. Like, how many good like prime years does LeBron have left? He's thirty four right now. And that's why, like, it was so. It felt so like weighty that they had to get this done at the deadline. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, it, in retrospect, it looks like the Pelicans were never even going to engage, but this is the, exactly the thing they needed to do. Go all in because it's, it's wasting another half season of LeBron's career. And yet, you know, obviously the, the kind of window closed with AD very quickly, but I feel like the window for all of these other guys is opening up quite a bit because we're looking at a Washington team that, you know, we, we had floated the kind of like Brandon Ingram for Bradley Beal type thing for most of the season. But now that DC is kind of burning down, uh, they might not have the leverage to really ask for, you know, right. all of that. You know, they could just be trying to rebuild this as quickly as they can. Did the Lakers set a baseline for how far they're willing to go when they're desperate? Mm. That's like true. When it comes to negotiations, yeah, like if you're the Lakers, yeah. is, is, is it like, oh, Brandon Ingram, ha, ha, ha. Like we actually need two first round picks right. of that too. Yeah, you know right. what I'm saying? It's well, like, that's the thing that the Pelicans, that happens. That's a good point. That it feels like the Pelicans did, maybe inadvertently, maybe purposefully, is like they showed everybody what the Lakers, how far the Lakers yeah, would go, yeah. which is pretty far. And yet they still wanted something more. Like they're offering yeah. five young players, right. two first round yeah. draft picks. That's a lot. That, like that that's acceptable. Probably, that was the biggest takeaway from this whole ordeal is just like, Man, you you can really like Magic Johnson is a pretty earnest person, and you could really drag that out and, right. and like kind of show the the kind of dark side of of things there. Well, we saw no like doubt. every every part of the quote unquote negotiations right. we heard about, like yeah, them Both sides. Lakers pulling out. The, well, like until we game. learned all those were not actually sure. For, yeah, but, for but real, the fact yeah. that it was out there, it may it created a sort of a yeah. discourse around those those players for sure. And, and the good news is tonight we have the juicy matchup Love of it. the Lakers and the Boston Celtics. It just, it just this is the Real perfect, yeah. yeah, this is the perfect game I want to watch after the trade deadline. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, nothing happened with either team. I don't think, well, you could maybe get to see an early glimpse of Mike Muscala or Mike Muscala on the bench. Uh, but that's tonight at 5 p.m. Pacific on TNT. I think the Lakers just need something. This is actually maybe even the perfect situation where they can kind of dig themselves out of a hole here. Like you've had that 42 point loss in Indiana. You kind of want to set the tone. This feels like a LeBron statement game. Yeah. And LeBron loves the, the lights. Rondo loves the limelight. Unless they just get pounded tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, the, the Celtics statistically are one of the te- best teams in basketball yeah. since they inserted the uh, Marcuses, Marcus Morris and Marcus Smart into the starting lineup. They've won, I think, uh, 10 out of their last 11 games. Top five in net rating. Yep. They they have been really spectacular as of late, and they're going against a Lakers team that is reeling. It, it could be either a defining win for the Lakers or... Oh, geez. Right. What do we do here? <laughs> right. I think LeBron goes for 40. That's it is right. funny how we, we talk about the Celtics as if they're in dire need for Anthony Davis. And they're literally one of the best teams in the NBA. Although, Anthony Davis is pretty good as well. <laughs> um, so, and remember, if you want to watch every NBA game, subscribe to NBA League Pass or NBA.com or your local cable or satellite provider. All right, let's talk about the other parts of this kind of, I don't even know what you would call it, saga, fiasco. What did you call it, Danny? The Anthony Davis... Super Bowl. The, the ghost of AD <laughs> the, Bowl. The ghost of AD Bowl. Uh, let's talk about it from the Pelicans' perspective. Ultimately, this might come down to the, one of the best troll jobs in NBA history, where it seems like Dell Demps might have strung them along. But I will say the repercussions will be felt immediately because right now they are sitting on a very big, disgruntled superstar who just got picked for the All-Star game next week but might not even play a single regular season game for the Pelicans from here on out. 
Like, what do you do, Danny, with Anthony Davis right now? Do you sit him and just just move along, or do you just try to put him back on the court? Well, he wants to play, right? So he, he said that he yeah. wants to play. And the thing with with Anthony Davis is he has an injury scare almost every single game, and so just blow out one of those injury scares. <laughs> he's, a, he's a nice young fella. No, no, he. I mean, he's literally just coming off a of finger sprain. Uh, it wouldn't take much. It would yeah. not take much. A does, shin does, injury. Does AD get disgruntled? He doesn't strike me as a guy who would get disgruntled. Perturbed, like, I, I, perhaps. Yeah, I, I guess like fuming. Yes, because if he wants to play and they're not letting him play, then it's like, okay. There's some tension there, but he, I don't know. He just doesn't strike me as a guy who would get like disgruntled about that. Much like the greats who came before him this season, <laughs> J.R. Smith and Carmelo Anthony, I would send his ass home. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because if AD gets a major injury, there goes all your yeah, leverage. Right. Uh, so for New Orleans, there's everything to lose by playing him in games because not only could he get hurt and therefore you're not going to get this massive trade package uh, or this explosive package as Adam Himmelsbach called it on the Boston Globe. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to get that if he gets a major injury, but also he helps you win games. Yeah. Do you really want to be in the playoffs right now or do you right. want to have higher lottery odds yeah. at getting Zion Williamson with right. the number one pick? I think that's what you want. So send him home. Yeah, I... I, I don't know. I, I think it's particularly cruel because this entire fiasco was driven by AD's presumed like bid to like help his legacy, to want to be the best player in the NBA, to compete for titles, not just for playoff spots. And now he might not even get a chance to play for the back end of the season. I remember when he got shut down when I was in New Orleans uh, at the end of the 2015-16 season, he literally started to like get teary-eyed because he could not play in the Olympics. Like I honestly think this guy is just fueled by wanting to win games and to be out on the court. And like I guess this is the downside. If you want to make these power plays, if you want to force your way into a situation, they're going to rob you of the one thing that kind of like right. defines you as a person. It's really kind of sad. That, that will to win is also exactly why I think other teams should feel confident they can keep him. Like everything, like I'm sure you know this better than anybody here. Like he's kind of a quiet, kind of non-confrontational person. Everything I've heard about him, is that true? Mm -hmm. You know, in your experience? So it's like, if you're a team assessing him as a person, if you're bringing him into a team that can make a run at either the conference finals or even the NBA finals and maybe even win it, I think based off his character and things that we know about him, you can feel confident that he'll probably stay instead of going to join a soon-to-be 36-year-old LeBron James with the Lakers in 2020. Like, why would he leave Boston or Denver or Toronto if one of those teams were to trade for him this summer when they could win a finals? And not just one finals, but multiple finals. That's what he's wanted this entire time. So I think for these teams this summer, I mean, the Lakers can still get him. They can still put together a fair package, but... I think any of these other teams, even if they're not on his list, should feel confident that they, that they could be able to keep him. But I think he would want, he would also have a really great shot at winning a finals with LeBron. Oh, like yeah, I don't for think sure. you know, right. like yeah. I don't. I, I get that that yes, there may be like better future basketball situations, but in but in the sense of you know whether he he's already been vocal or at least it's been very publicized out there how he doesn't want to end up in Boston. So I mean like is that that's, him or clutch? I mean that's is the that thing. That's, that's the question. That's the question that we're looming over everything. I just it, it feels like it's inevitable that he ends up in LA. I'm right. of the belief that if AD went to Boston and Kyrie stayed and now there's obviously scuttlebutt that like Kyrie might look elsewhere but I think if AD were there, Kyrie would probably look to stay because they are friends and they, they presumably want to play together. I think AD would be fine there. That's the big variable. It's like if Kyrie this summer, you know, July 1st rolls around, he's like, you know what? I want to go to New York and join with KD or go back, join the Clippers. Who knows? Yeah. Right. If he leaves, then suddenly Boston, I think they're in a position where they're not giving up Tatum, right? The, Celt- you- the Celtics' fatal flaw was making an incredible trade for Kyrie Irving and not being able to pair these guys together before this summer, before they don't have a half season to play Kyrie and AD together sh- so they, they can know how good it can be together. Isn't that kind of a weird rule when you like really think it's about it? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. It makes no sense. It's like, I, I wonder like when they're designing that rule, I wonder where it comes from to say, we're not going to allow a team to trade for two rookies who were signed as designated players, but but like you, it's allowed to trade for like, say, two all NBA players or, yeah. some, or something like that. It's probably Dan Gilbert. Because he <laughs> does all the bad things in the league. <laughs> it's um, not a bad rule. I don't know. Yeah, but like, I, it, like yeah, yeah, exactly. What was the yeah. origin point? What was the, what was yeah. the Well, I'd love to know. Yeah. I, I guess if the idea is to like keep your own players and if if the 
previous CBA negotiations were defined by guys teaming up together. Yeah, this is a way to keep the Wade, Bosch, LeBron situation from happening on another team. No doubt. It's an, it's an sure. extra hurdle. For, right. For right. 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 It's a smart rule for that way. For that and yet reason, it's, yeah. the super teams are still going to happen and keep mm-hmm. happening. Yeah. I, I The one little wrinkle that I'm looking out for here is just like, when does the league get involved here if Anthony yeah, yeah. Davis is a healthy scratch and I can't imagine that Clutch is going to be quiet now <laughs> about the fact that Anthony Davis is healthy and ready and able to play does the league start to to worry more about the rest games because this was a thing what two years ago where they made this big kerfuffle over uh, guys can't rest for especially for national games you have to have an actual injury yada 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 and then all of a sudden a few things happen and then we just all stop talking about it I do think it's incumbent upon the league if they want to enforce these rules to like to enforce them now again when a similar situation is coming up uh and i also wonder like in new orleans like how are other players going to perceive them shutting down anthony davis like do you think that this is going to have a ripple effect to other star players where new orleans wasn't much of a destination before but like maybe t- uh, even some of these kind of lower level free agents aren't going to want to play there if they're just going to hijack the second half of your season the thing about that though is that like much like we talk about how like Unfor- like not unfortunately, but just the reality of the fact is the NBA is a business. It is a business. Like that also fits into that. It's a business for the Pelicans, and they can't afford to have Davis injure himself and thus, you know, uh, mess up the trade that's going to happen in the future. But on that point, like the Pelicans removed Davis from the injury report for tonight's game. So oh, really? There you go. I don't know what that means, but there, he's not on the injury report anymore. Well, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. Uh, I, I think it's interesting. Just some of the other moves that they made on the fringes while they were waiting for the AD thing to happen. Uh, we talked about the Miritich trade. They also picked up a second from Washington when they tried to dump uh, Marquise Morris's contract. I wonder if Marquise Morris will even give him a look, like or even a roster spot there, or he'll he'll just get let go because he is, as we know, a clutch client. Yep. So that definitely makes things <laughs> particularly interesting. But like going forward here, what do you think is the best like approach with the Pelicans? Like. Do they keep a Julius Randle? Do they build their team around Drew Holiday? Do they just pack it in, get the pick, and go from there? I don't know. What's the move? <laughs> Open I think it should go for Open the yeah, I think it should go for the pick. I mean, I I think yeah. there's a way that this this could reboot pretty quickly here. Yeah, especially depending on the haul that they get in, in the eventual trade. No, no doubt about it. They could be good pretty soon. Uh, I I I think they have you know Drew Holiday is a really really good player. Yeah, Drew, right. Julius Randle has has developed along really nicely for them, so it's not like they don't have any talent on the team. If you the, if you get that explosive package <laughs> from Boston or another team <laughs> for, <laughs> for for Anthony Davis, well, you're setting yourself up pretty nicely. If on top of that, you're getting even besides Zion Williamson, there's a couple nice prospects in this draft. You know, R.J. Barrett, mm-hmm. John Morant. If you're getting one of these guys or someone else pops. Well, you're set up pretty nicely for for with a nice young core uh, for the next, you know, hopefully seven, eight, ten years. Yeah, and one thing we were just talking about in the office earlier is if there is a big contract that let's say the Celtics have to move, is it Gordon Hayward or is it a guy like an Al Horford who has a player option for next season? And while he probably wouldn't opt out, uh, opt in just to get traded to some far off destination, like Drew Holiday uh, and. Horford share the same agent. I think they have the same kind of disposition. Uh, And I wonder if they would want to team up. If only for like maybe one season, make a go of it. You bring back Julius Randle. You have this draft pick. You have maybe like a Tatum. That's a pretty good team. I think that's a playoff team. And if I'm Dell Demps, that's definitely what I'm selling to my ownership in the meantime. Hey, don't get rid of me because I'm going to get this Celtics package and we're going to reboot this really quickly. I think that trade package uh, for Boston, Keith Smith from Yahoo, uh, brought up earlier this earlier today with the Celtics opening a roster spot with the Jabari Bird trade. Now they're in a position to sign a player for the rest of the season with a two-year deal, non-guaranteed for the second season. And that would be useful for them to use as that salary matching player in an AD trade. Because if you're packaging Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, and I don't know, Robert Williams, you need more money in there to make the deal work. Uh, so that's something to watch for the rest of the season, that the player they sign could end up being the guy that's utilized in a trade this summer for Anthony Davis. So they don't have to give Horford or Gordon Hayward in a trade. So do you think that they would still put, it sounds like they would, but I'm just wondering, like, they would still put Tatum on the table even though they have no assurances from Anthony Davis that he's going to stay there? I, I think I think they would put Tatum up there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I do. 
I mean, and if you're the Pelicans, Kyrie stays. and if you're the player on stats, the trade you do. Well, look, if Kyrie stays, if Kyrie stays, and and also like look around the landscape. I mean, the Lakers package, as we just mentioned, isn't that bad. Like we, I don't think we're high it's on good. a lot of those guys, but there's still some talent in there, plus some picks. And then the Knicks, you ha- always have to worry about the Knicks here, even if they don't land number one overall. If it's number two, and you have a like a beeline to R.J. Barrett or someone like that, that's also pretty good. That will uh, allow the Pelicans to kind of reboot here even quicker. So I don't know. I think it seems unlikely they'll be able to do it without Tatum. I think. Oh yeah, I, th- I think Tatum needs to be in there ultimately. I don't know if you can build a better package with Jalen Brown as the centerpiece. The one, yeah. the one interesting thing with Boston is like this deadline. You know, is kind of good for them in a way. Uh, I think with the Clippers pick potentially rolling over to next season. The Grizzlies trading Marcus Gasol and being worse, that pick is top eight protected this year. It's beneficial for Boston to have that future pick, I think, from the Clippers and that future pick from the Grizzlies in a trade for Anthony Davis rather than picks in this year. I mean, we'll, I'm sure we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks right. um, on the corner three, Danny. But like this draft class is really, really weak, especially like towards the middle of the middle of the first round and beyond. So I think for Boston. Their draft picks are a bit stronger now. Granted, that Sacramento pick still isn't going to be what anybody would have expected it to be entering right. the season. Yeah. I, I wonder, the Celtics, if they're not the biggest winner, they're among them, just yeah. from, for the fact that AD is going to be in play now. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing they were hoping on, right? It, 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 if if the Pelicans somehow gave in to the Lakers, it spells you know disaster for them because then Kyrie feels like all but gone in, in, in a lot of sense, in, in a lot of senses. So, yeah, I don't know. I think... They didn't make a move, unlike the rest of the East, but they have sort of like bigger plans ahead. So it's almost like there's, yeah. a, there's a balancing there. Right. Uh, they're, they're the team probably for next year, whereas a lot of these other teams are trying to take advantage of the window now. I didn't think it's a good question, considering that we just talked about how well the Celtics have been playing of late. Like, where do they stack up in comparison to these three other East Goliaths that have just been formed on the trade? I honestly day? still think they're right there. Like, you, you, you look at their team, and we've seen from last year that they are, like, I was talking about matchup proofing, you know, these rosters. The Celtics are kind of the forerunners of that. You know, yeah. they yeah. they matchup proofed before anyone else needed to, you know. They have they have a lineup for every single situation, right. still. And Brad Stevens, with a couple days to game plan, as we saw, can take LeBron James out of out of a game to a certain extent and take away some of these other guys. It, it, I still think that in a playoff series, that's not a team you want to see. Uh, I think ultimately it comes down to where where will Gordon Hayward be yeah. in April, May, and you and they would hope June, right? If Hayward is the same and consistent guy that can't really can't really get to the rim or finish around the rim, well, that's going to hurt them obviously. Uh, but he's shown flashes of being that guy he was in Utah, and if he's able to work his way back by the playoffs. Uh, that puts them right on par with those teams, and if not, maybe above them, if Hayward's back to form. But th- I think that's a lot to ask for for this season yeah. with an injury he had. I think next year you can maybe hope for that for him, whether it's in Boston somewhere else. But this season, that that seems like a bit optimistic to hope for. Right, and that's why, again, back to the AD point, it feels like they're trying to win now, but also playing for the long run and, and having those bigger plans. It, it, like This has been reported, I think, but like Boston, someone mentioned Boston's ownership like mandated like going for the championship this season. And that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why Boston didn't trade Terry Rozier. But they had op- opportunities to. I, sure. I, I know Phoenix was interested earlier in the season. But Rozier is A, Kyrie insurance in case he yeah, walks. Exactly. But also like a good backup point guard. He might have done more damage than good <laughs> this season, but, <laughs> yeah, but he, off, yeah. he's good to have him, especially given Kyrie's injury concerns. All right, we're going to take one more quick break, and then we're going to talk about some of our favorite trades. Basketball is very good. All right, we're back. We're going to wrap up the trade downline here, talk about some of the more fringy moves, some of our favorites. Paolo, you probably have the more high-profile one of the group here, so let's hear it. Yeah, I loved the Fultz of the Magic trade because it feels right. Like, it's something that has been... Because he's so magical? Yeah, exactly. There's still <laughs> some magic left. I'd like to believe there's still some magic left in the Fultz experience, you right. know? And it's just the right spot for him to work out whatever he needs to work out, whether it's mental or whether it's physical. It's a team that is kind of just there in the Eastern Conference, still trying to make the playoffs apparently, but also just doesn't have a lot of attention to them. They need point guard figure going forward. 
he makes a lot of sense in that and and in just a place where he can do things without it being on a national like platform. And I think the Sixers got back, you know, they didn't get back Terrence Ross, but they got back a piece in Jonathan Simmons and picks and free up freeing up cap space too. So I just like that because I want Fultz to thrive at some point of his career. What do we, how do we feel about Jonathan Simmons? Uh, do we have any opinion on Jonathan? Fine. Look, if, just if, another he body. Can, if he can, he was actually a pretty big difference maker in the playoffs, what, like two or three years ago? For the Spurs, right? So like, look, if he can regain some of that and yeah. maybe shoot back to his career average from three, which is like 35%, then he can be a useful piece, I guess, but it's just like not, it's not a sexy move. You talk about Fultz regaining magic with the magic. It's like every player that leaves the Spurs loses everything. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's Except for Aaron Baines. Except for Aaron Baines, yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of Fultz just retreating to obscurity, and I, I hope yeah. for the best for him. It's exactly. hard to have any like ill will toward that guy. Considering everything he does, although maybe like chill it on like some of the snack foods, um, <laughs> I am kind of confused why they gave up a first and a second in this deal. It seems like a lot for a guy that we don't even know could like make it onto an NBA court. I think I would have given him more. Really, I would have been willing to. I think. I mean, look, one of those picks is top twenty protected in a garbage draft, and and the other one um, is a second round pick, and also in a garbage draft. So, so I think you know Jonathan Simmons is not part of their future. Markel Fultz. I look at it this way: in this week draft, Fultz is a lottery pick. He's still a lottery pick, yeah. even after sure. this issue that he's had and all sure. you know the doubt that his shot ever returns. I still think in his time with Philadelphia, and this is why Sixers fans are you know a little bit disappointed about it, is because the fact he showed everything else except for the shot. He still showed the athleticism yeah. and the ability to drive to the rim, the ability to pass. You know, as a young player, his defense was shaky, like it is for any young point guard. But he still had yeah. solid moments. I just think the team moved too fast in one direction for him to even have a shot of oh, yeah. catching up. That's that's just what it comes down to. Which is like they have yeah. just sped up their process to where they are now, which the Tobias Harris trade being the latest example. And there's no there was no place for him anymore. I just wish the Hawks were more interested. Because yeah. they had pieces that the Sixers that's a could point. definitely have used. Yeah. Right. And as we talked about before, Lloyd Pierce uh, is the coach down in Atlanta. He used to be a coach in Philly. Apparently, he and Fultz got along. Uh, I'm at the NBA's version of Occam's Razor with Fultz, which sure. I guess would be Anthony Bennett's Razor. Uh, it's just, if you're not good, you're not good. <laughs> and I, mean, I know he's killing it for the Agua Caliente Clippers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. I, I just, I, I mean, yes, I get it that he still has a lottery prospect in there somewhere. I just like, man... If the tape we're working off of it is his free throw form, like I want nothing to do with that guy. I mean, I I would give him a chance if he was just on the street and like you could put him into your G League system or you could put him on your NBA team and kind of stash him away for a little bit. I just I I have no hope left. But if you're the Magic, you yeah, no, I, I get it. I just wouldn't have given up any picks for him. That, part, mm, that's fair. Part of me is really just hoping for a happy ending to this story. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think giving up those picks, like yeah, you'd love to have. Uh, whoever you're going to take at the end of the, like the 25th pick with that OKC pick, um, if it even conf- conveys, because if it doesn't, it turns into a 2022 20, second rounder and a 2023 20, second rounder, if it even conveys. So it might end up being no first round picks if OKC drops to like 18th in, in, this, in the NBA standings, and then it'll be two seconds, yeah. or th- three seconds total in the trade. Yeah. All right, Danny, what's your favorite deal? So I've always kind of dreamt of being an accountant. Okay. <laughs> it's just I was never wow. really good at numbers, uh-huh. and so I, I could never crunch them. So I really respected that uh, Tyler Johnson, Ryan Anderson trade. Okay. Just it, it was an wow. incredible move. Uh, shouts out to Albert Ahmad, who really broke it down and really <laughs> gave some context into why it was so good. Like the Miami Heat were pretty much hamstrung, like because of all of the deals that they made in 2016. And the fact that they were g- able to get under the luxury tax, that's amazing. Albert is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> he, is, he is one of the best Twitter follows. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd probably, if I could like keep tw- 10 people to follow on Twitter, he'd probably be one of them. He's really wow. important. He's, incredible. He's the I'm Twitter follow the you'd keep on a desert island. Very, under, very, <laughs> very important to have for, for salary cap knowledge. Yeah, Albert, and, Albert's great. And he just does this for fun is my, yeah. my understanding. Um, yeah, well, I... I don't have any interesting thoughts about this no, trade. None. Like, I just think the Heat are boring as hell, like, and they've gotten more boring as a result of this. 
Tyler Johnson, uh, this is my only thought. <laughs> Tyler, I mean, it's like everybody's talking about it's Phoenix needs a point guard. Phoenix needs a point guard. Well, Booker's your primary yeah. ball handler. Now you have another combo guard and Johnson who can also share those reps. And maybe you can test out Booker a little bit more off ball with a, not a primary guy in Johnson, but a secondary guy. I, I like go. it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that Johnson gets unnecessarily knocked because of his contract, yeah. because he took a favorable deal for himself, and he's obviously never going to live up to whatever it is. Is it 19 million? Is it up there? Yeah. It's, it's, it's I believe the story was that he almost threw up or did throw up when he found out how yep. much he was getting. <laughs> I would too if I was telling <laughs> Johnson. Um, it, but I think there's a fine player in there, and so sure. like, why not take a take a little bit of a risk if you're the Suns? Uh, all right, Kevin, what is your favorite deal of, of our deadline here? My favorite deal is Otto Porter. Oh, yes. wow. being traded from the Washington Wizards to the Chicago Bulls for Jabari Parker, Bobby Portis, and a 2023 second round pick. Uh, the reason why is because I'm just intrigued to see Porter in this new environment. How, how will they try to Harrison Barnes him by giving him more on ball opportunities? Because, I mean, uh, it's true. He's been very efficient across the board in different play types, including pick and roll last season uh, and into this season as well. I'm, I want to see if there's more to his game within that uh, Jim Boylan offense. Gosh. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> High octane Jim Boylan. I mean, the odds are is he's going to lose some of his, his really uh, – really high efficiency right. that he had in Washington as a secondary player. But I hope we get to see him with the ball more. And then the inverse uh, for, for Bobby Portis. I really like him. I really like Bobby Portis. And I think there'll be an opportunity for more heavier minutes, more consistent heavy minutes with the Washington Wizards entering his restricted free agency this summer. Uh, I'm excited to see how Portis develops. He's still young. The Bulls love him. I mean, Zach, Zach Levine was talking about how he was basically his best friend on the team and how he basically kept the team together, which is saying a lot because <laughs> this year has been awful right, well, in so many different he's, ways. He's also the guy who punched the Kilomeritage. Yeah, if you're worried. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, you know, that's a bonding experience, would you say? <laughs> yes, bonding his, his hand to someone's <laughs> yeah. face, yeah. Uh, no, I, I think Kevin has more Bulls optimism from like anyone in the world. <laughs> I, <laughs> you were all in on the Parker I would be very... Not very, but I would be quite high on the Bulls if they didn't have Boylan. Because if you think about it, they have Markkinen. What? Yeah. Zach Levine sucks. No, <laughs> they have Laurie Markkinen and Wendell Carter, who are both good. And Wendell's hurt. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm not talking about this season. I'm just talking about going forward. Like that, That's the thing, Paolo. I'm high on them because they have Boylan. Because they're tanking. <laughs> that, because yeah. he makes the team worse. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, in that sense, yes. But I'm yes. just talking about, okay, now you had Otto Porter to Markkinen and Wendell Carter and possibly another pick. It's kind of interesting. I just wish they were not coached by him. They have some interesting guys. My issue with the trade from Chicago's side is, is that they're basically sucking up their cap uh, rather, and bringing in Porter rather than trying to chase some of these free agents that they could. But would I, they I just, get anybody? That's Well, yeah, here's the right. thing. like Probably not. But like, I don't feel like this is like a Charlotte or a Memphis situation where you need to do that. Like, you're Chicago. Nobody act like you're Chicago. Nobody's gonna want to run wind sprints. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, <laughs> That's nobody's, a, gonna, nobody's gonna want to come. Back it's there. hard to argue. I think that. if you're Chicago, tank the hell out of the season. <laughs> tank the hell out of next season, and then in 2021, when Porter's contract is up. Maybe at that point you can start making some moves. Twenty that's two years from now. This is Amen. like it's already been two years. Yo, There's sucks for so long. Time moves by so quickly. <laughs> this, this is a theme in the corner three. Two years is not a long time. It's not. It is for me, it's man. I'm fucking 31. <laughs> I only have so many good years left. <laughs> Jesse wants to be a competitive bull team before he's 40. We need to get this going. I'm about to die. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, on that note, my favorite deal uh, was one for a team that is going for it now, the Sacramento Kings. Yes. Yeah, they got sure. Harrison Barnes. And not only do they got they, they did they get a guy that I think can help them immediately who slides into that 3-4 spot that they've kind of been shaky at right now. They did it for relatively pennies. Justin Jackson Bad player. I do not want him on my team. Zach Randolph wasn't playing. He, I don't think he logged a single minute in this season. He's been in, inactive the entire time. And so he's just kind of hanging in, out. In Memphis, I, I think. Still. <laughs> really? Just hanging out. Yeah. At home. Oh, in wow. Memphis. Well, they have good barbecue. I don't blame him. Uh, I think I saw a report that they are going to buy him out from Dallas, which mm -hmm. if I was him, like, just give me all the money. I'm just going to hang out for the rest of the season. Yeah. 
But for the Kings, I, I, I don't know. It just makes a lot of sense. I love their young core. I think there's a lot of good numbers floating around about their their star kind of three-guard lineup there with Fox, McDonavich, and Buddy Heald. I've definitely come around on Buddy Heald since he was drafted in New Orleans, and I said many a bad things about him. <laughs> I just think Barnes is the type of guy you could slide him in at the four. You could play a little bit bigger. You could move, or excuse me, you play him at the three and play a little bit bigger. You could put him at the four and match up that way. I think... If you put in Harry Giles or Bagley and at the five next to him, that's a team that could score 200 points a game and maybe give up 300 wow. points a game, which won't be good for their playoff push, but entertaining. This is <laughs> still the most entertaining team in the league, and I think they got even more entertaining yeah. today. Well, and it also helps that the Clippers seem to be not going for that playoff spot that they right. currently hold and that the Lakers didn't get a D. So, you know, there's a the window's open. The window's the creaking open. For a first round for a first round series. Yeah, to be clear. But, but they don't have hey. their picks, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, like, exactly. They should be pushing for the playoffs. Uh, I, I think for Dallas, it's like now their playoff hopes are gone. They, they were pretty much gone as is already. Uh, now for them, it's like about looking forward. Uh, now they can open up max cap space this summer. Uh, I don't know who would go to Dallas necessarily. It doesn't <laughs> seem like it projects favorably for them unless, yeah. unless DeMarcus Cousins. There you go. DeMarcus With Chris Tops? I'm just saying. That'd be uh, interesting. That's a weird fit. It'd be, it's a weird fit, but you know. I'm Sorry, Charles. If you're going to spend this summer, I wonder who you go for. There was rumblings years ago before, you know, before Boogie got traded to New Orleans that they, they had interest. They had Jaleel Cousins on their G League team. Wow, I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I, we'll see. I mean, they're they're really they're really gunning for for Giannis. That's I, I know. in 2021. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, two, let's, two years let's, will be here before we know it, Danny. Oh, exactly. Well, I'll say this: like if if teams are still in the AD Derby, would make some sense if you start angling toward Drew Holiday. And Drew Holiday is yeah. a guy that they definitely uh, talked about before he decided to re up in New Orleans for all that money. I think he would be a really good fit next to Luka Doncic and yeah, and and kind of augment what they already have there. So they have some options. Can I add one? Deal to to the favorite oh, deal maker Paolo Getty. Uh, yeah, it's sure. a future deal. It has not happened yet. It's, I love it already. Go for it. When the Lakers sign Carmelo, it will become my favorite transaction oh, deadline. Yeah. yeah, we should talk about that deal very quickly. Though yeah. they they basically the the Clippers rerouted Mike Muscala and mm-hmm. picked up Ivaka Zubac, a guy who was in the AD package reportedly just a couple days ago. Yeah, uh, as well as Michael Beasley, who's going to get <laughs> sure. waived. Uh, but they did so. In part to open up a roster spot mm-hmm. in order to sign somebody, somebody, someone who may be a little bit of a doughy three four type who can take a lot of shots. Who may for be them. close to LeBron and have a relationship with him. Maybe, maybe that's the type of move where you don't get Anthony Davis and you kind of appease your best player by getting, you know, just a good. I'm, a I'm guy here for, for it. Them. Yeah, I'm, that's right. a straight up rooting for content uh, situation. Are, are we done here? Like, <laughs> what, what are we talking about here? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it may be, <laughs> and instead of boogie, you try to throw a lot of money at D'Angelo Russell. A guy who can play on ball and off ball. Are you talking about the Mavericks? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Are you saying we're done here? I was like, one more thought. (laughs) All right, that's it for us. uh, For Paolo, for Danny, for Kevin O'Connor, for Bobby Wagner on the boards. Uh, This has been Chatting in the Corner. We'll see you next time. Basketball is very good. Basketball is very good.